Peace YouTube. I've compiled a series of news video reports on the recent Amtrak passenger train derailment in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I intend to use my knowledge about trains, which by the way is 22 years of experience with electric trains on the CTA lines in Chicago, Illinois. And I believe based on my experience with those trains, I'm a professional with an extensive background in the occurrences that happens with trains. So I'm gonna give my expert opinion on the following videos as we go. I have evidence and reason to believe that the train was not speeding and that this derailment was no accident. I also have reason to believe that the engineer of the train is not responsible for this derailment and I'm going to show you why. the scene of the deadliest Amtrak wreck in 16 years. It happened right there behind me where you see those cranes on the busiest rail corridor in North America. 2,200 trains a day travel those rails between Boston and Washington. This is an aerial shot of the spot just to my left where a speeding northeast regional train jumped the tracks last night. There were 238 passengers on board and a crew of five. At least seven are dead, more than 200 injured. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board are here, and tonight, crews are moving the train to a secure location. Hour after hour, police, firefighters, and other rescue workers search desperately for anyone who might still be trapped in the wreckage of Amtrak train 188. The rail lines north out of Philadelphia are straight with a speed limit of 70 miles an hour. But approaching the Frankfurt neighborhood, a left corner, the speed there cut to 50 miles an hour. But Amtrak train 188 leaves the Philly station at 9.10 p.m. and 11 minutes later at 9.21, it's traveling at twice that speed, 106 miles an hour, when the engineer trips the emergency brakes. It's too I intend to show why this Amtrak train, train, train was not tracks, doing anywhere near 106 miles force. an hour. The engineer during the time of the derailment. Minor injuries. He talked to police briefly, but did not give a formal statement before calling a lawyer and the police station. Can you think of any reason a train having just left a station would get up to 100 miles an hour? Well, we, we want to look at that. We want to look at the acceleration of the train. We want to look at how the train was operated. The one-year-old high-tech electric engine came... Now, right here, they refer to that engine. It's an engine, mind you. It's a diesel engine. They're referring to it as a high-tech electric engine. Electric and engine don't go together. When you refer to electric, you're talking about a motor, okay? As I was a motorman because we was dealing with electric trains, okay? This is a diesel-operated locomotive engine, not an electric motor. To rest upright in the dirt, but behind it, the first passenger car, twisted and mangled. The next three cars on their side, the last three still standing. The last seconds of the Amtrak train 188, closed circuit video obtained by our station WPVI. It's very questionable that, corner, that a engine, is the a single engine pulling an eight car passenger train minute, full of passengers could actually from accelerate to from 70 miles an hour just to 106 miles an hour in that short period of time. I have, have serious questions about two. that. Mere seconds into the turn, we could see the train tilting ten, uh, approximately 10 degrees to the right, and then the recording went blank. How convenient is it for the recording to go blank just before it shows that the train actually flipped over or uh, what actually happened when the train came to a rest. I think that's too convenient. 
ABC News has learned the train engineer gave initial statements to police detectives here, as authorities also reveal some of the 238 passengers on board are still unaccounted for tonight. As Leonard Knobs, a husband and father, recovers, this was his first time taking the train trapped underneath. He told me he remembers the officer who held his hand. One cop. We're getting to the evidence that I have that the train was not speeding at the time of the derailment. In other words, it wasn't going anywhere near 100 miles an hour when the train derailed. And the evidence is in what these people don't say. All of the injured parties and all of the injured people that they interview, none of them mention anything about the train feeling like it was speeding up or that it was going too fast. It's very easy to determine when the train is speeding up when you're sitting on it. And none of these people mention anything about that. One cop actually stopped, knelt down, and held my hand until the paramedics came with me, which made me feel comfort. That patient in the trauma ward telling me he hasn't slept yet, saying that every time he closes his eyes, he says he feels like they're crashing again. Amtrak has a, has a system that they call ACES, which is basically a positive train control system. They've got ACES installed throughout much of the Northeast corridor. However, unfortunately, it was not installed in this particular section of the track. We want to find out why was it not here? As crews work to clear the wreckage, the investigation into the deadly derailment is increasingly focused on the train's engineer, Brandon Boshton. The National Transportation Safety Board says the train was traveling at 106 miles per hour, where the track curves more than double the speed limit for that section. The engineer applied the emergency brake moments before it derailed, but it did little to slow the train down. Did a question enter your mind how this first passenger car wind up twisted and mangled like it was and all of the rest of them was intact even the engine the engine derailed and it was upright it didn't even flip over if a train was going to flip over in a curve the first thing to flip over would be the first car which the first car in this case was the engine keep that in mind philadelphia's mayor said there is no reason the engineer should have been traveling that fast Clearly, he was reckless and irresponsible uh, in uh, his actions. I don't know what was going on with him. I don't know what was going on in the cab, uh, but there's really no excuse uh, that could be offered. Boston lives in Queens, New York, and has been an Amtrak engineer since 2010. His attorney told ABC News Nightline Boston has no memory of the accident. Also keep in mind that this attorney that spoke for the engineer was probably hired by Amtrak to make those statements about the engineer not having any recollection about what transpired. Of course, he wouldn't have any recollection because he don't want to say anything that would incriminate the uh, railroad, which in this case was Amtrak. So keep that in mind as we go because it's going to be crucially important to understand that they always want to place human error at the cause of these type of things. I have first-hand experience about how they do those things, so take my word for it. He remembers driving the train. Uh, he remembers going to that area generally. Has absolutely no recollection of the incident or anything unusual. After the crash, he was treated for injuries and taken to a police station. He declined to make a statement before leaving with his lawyer. And as of Wednesday, he had yet to speak with NTSB investigators. I wanted to ask you the significance of the amount of speed this train had when it approached the curve. The trains go over this, uh, this particular curve many times a day and trains don't derail. Here we've got one that's doing twice the speed and it derails. Surveillance video shows the train moments before it went off the tracks. The camera captured the electrical sparks from the crash. On when but they tried to let on that this train was electric, remember? high-tech electric engine. The, the, the train is not electric. The uh, engine creates electricity that uh, runs the different components of the train, like the lights and so forth that's in the passenger compartments and that, but the train is not uh, running off of electricity. So where did these sparks come from that they claim happened during the crash? I'll tell you what happened. I'll tell you what I think happened anyway. I think that it was an explosion, and those sparks came from the explosion, and the explosion was in that first passenger car.
These are the last seconds of the Amtrak train 188, closed circuit video obtained by our station WPVI. As the train hits that corner, all we can see is the flash. In those last seconds, the last minute, the eight-car train increased speed from 70 to more than 100 miles an hour, just 16 seconds before the crash. Investigators have seen the onboard video, too. Mere seconds into the turn, we could see the train tilting ten, uh, approximately 10 degrees to the right, and then the recording went blank. The 32-year-old engineer suffered a concussion and has amnesia, according to his attorney. No memory of the moments leading up to the crash, but he will talk with investigators. The key question, why did the train accelerate to more than 100 miles an hour, twice the speed limit of that curve? Along the tracks of the devastating derailment, the crumpled remains of the first passenger car and the engine. That engine is equipped with speed control technology, which would have prevented this disaster. But as of this morning, that technology is not along these tracks. And Chris, what do you know? Well, Scott, it is still very, very early in this investigation. But late today, Robert Sumwall from the National Transportation Safety Board told us the investigation is increasingly focusing on the speed of the train in the moments right before the deadly derailment. Maximum authorized speed through this curve was 50 miles per hour. When the engineer induced brake application was applied, the train was traveling at approximately 106 miles per hour. Three seconds later, when the data to the recorders terminated, the train speed was 102 miles per hour. The NTSB says it has not yet spoken to the train's engineer. Earlier, Philadelphia's mayor said the engineer was treated for injuries suffered in the crash and then taken to a police station. But the Philadelphia Police Department says he declined to make a statement before leaving the station with a lawyer. What he isn't saying, the train's event recorder and front dash camera may reveal. Our mission is to find out not only what happened, but why it happened so that we can prevent it from happening again. The engine and all seven passenger cars flew off the tracks in the violent derailment. A law enforcement official tells CBS News there is no evidence of terrorism or sabotage. Pennsylvania Senator Pat Toomey toured the crash site this afternoon. Describe for me the scene. It's a horrifying scene. Um, there, are, there are train cars that are completely unrecognizable as train cars. I mean, they've been destroyed, completely destroyed. Investigators will also be looking at the aging cars themselves. They date from the 1970s. What else do you know about what happened to the train in the moments before it left the tracks? For example, did the engineer hit the brakes? Just moments before the derailment, uh, the engineer placed the uh, train into the emergency mode. That, that applies the emergency brakes at their full application. We know that. That was just moments before the derailment. We want to know, again, why was the train traveling at the speed that it was? Is there any indication that there was any fault in the track itself? Now, we will be looking at the, uh, at the condition of the track. We'll be looking at the traffic control signals to see what they were displaying. We'll be looking at the mechanical condition of the train. So uh, nothing is off the table. I'd say that everything is on the table right now. Robert Sumwalt, member of the National Transportation Safety Board, leading this investigation. Thank you very much. It turns out that one of the worst train wrecks in U.S. history happened 71 years ago on the same curve in the tracks at Frankfurt Junction, the site of last night's derailment. It was Labor Day, 1943. An axle broke on the Pennsylvania Railroad's Congressional Limited. 79 people were killed and 117 injured. Men you know what? They can't believe that all of us is going to believe that this was an accident when this exact same thing happened in 1944 actually it was during the midst of world war ii on labor day which was september the 4th which was approximately one year before the war was over this derailment was no accident i don't know what their intent was behind this derailment i believe that their intent was to kill a lot more people than it was actually killed just like what happened in 1944 but that didn't take place so what they intended to accomplish by this act of terrorism is beyond my scope of 
imagination at this point, but when I find out, I will let you know. I'll tell you something else. That engineer knew this railroad. He knew every nick, kink, curve, and everything else in his railroad. That's what you do when you travel the same railroad hundreds of times during the course of your career. You know, most of these uh, routes have what they call, it's a run. You might have three trips. That means three trips in each direction. So once a day, he goes across this section of railroad three times. So if you do that for five years, you mean to tell me you don't know this railroad? He knows every place where uh, the, the railroad slows down when it's bad track. He knows all of that. It was no accident. This engineer was not uh, uh, operating that train at a hundred and something miles an hour through stories. that curve. Among them, Beth Davids. Once the car started filling up with smoke, we actually climbed out the top. Um, it was when I was sitting on the top of the side of the car, um, and we like looked out. You could see the first, the, the engine and the first car is just crushed. On Wednesday, rescuers expanded the search area, looking for those who are still unaccounted for. One of the survivors, 30-year-old George Alexiadis, suffered injuries to his right arm. He remembers the chaos inside the train. There was a girl that landed, ended up where you put your luggage. She ended up there. She like hit her head and ended up there. And I had to help her down. And I just still can't believe that I was on that train. The train and in the dark, the passengers stunned. Was there any warning at all before no. this happened? No. Basically the train tilted over and rolled. The train left Washington's Union Station just after 7.10 last night, bound for New York City. It stopped at Philadelphia's 30th Street Station. Then, at 9.21, about nine miles from the station where the track curves, the Now, right here, they simulate the train crash or the train derailment, and they show one car, which is moving, crash into the side of another car and mangle it up. Right here, they just simply show it as being split. But that type of thing don't happen. Both cars was moving. So that type of uh, uh, mangled mess that you saw, the depiction of the uh, actual real car, could not have happened like they said it did right here. It didn't happen like that. It happened uh, like I said. It, was, it had to be a bomb of some sort. The engine and seven passenger cars. First responders had only flashlights to cut through the darkness. Philadelphia Mayor Michael Nutter rushed to the scene. It is an absolute disastrous mess. Uh, never seen anything like this uh, in my life. 54 of the most seriously injured passengers were rushed to Temple University Hospital. Today, about two dozen remain hospitalized. Dr. Herbert Cushing is chief medical officer. I was surprised at the number of rib injuries that surprised me in, in the relative uh, few uh, head injuries. Um, and I think we we're fortunate that there, there weren't more deaths. Things could have been a lot worse. Instinct. The train's engine, less than a year old, and the tracks inspected the day before. The NTSB confirmed the train was going more than 100 miles an hour before it derailed. The engineer who was at the controls told his lawyer he cannot remember what happened. We will talk with the NTSB lead investigator about that in just a moment. But first, Chris Van Cleve is near the scene of the crash in northeast Philadelphia. Chris, good morning. Good morning. Investigators yesterday recovered a data recorder and a camera that's being analyzed. And this morning, crews are back out at the crash site. This is the investigation increasingly centers around the train's excessive speed. As crews work to clear the wreckage, the investigation into the deadly derailment is increasingly focused on the train's engineer, Brandon Boston. The National Transportation Safety Board says the train was traveling at 106 miles per hour where the track curves more than double the speed limit for that section. The engineer applied the emergency brake moments before it derailed, but it did little to slow the train down. I want to point out about this simulation. It's grossly inadequate. It appears that the engine was the only thing that was applying brakes. That's not how those trains operate. This is a locomotive, in other words, it's a diesel-operated engine, and so it does the pulling. Each and every car, each and every passenger car, has air brakes attached to it. So each car brakes, not just the engine. 
The engine may very well just do the pulling, but it's not the only thing that does the stopping. Philadelphia's mayor said there is no reason the engineer should have been traveling that fast. Clearly he was reckless and irresponsible uh, in uh, his actions. I don't know what was going on with him. I don't know what was going on in the cab, uh, but there's really no excuse uh, that could be offered. Boston lives in Queens, New York, and has been an Amtrak engineer since 2010. His attorney told ABC News Nightline Boston has no memory of the accident. He remembers driving the train. Uh, he remembers going to that area generally. Has absolutely no recollection of the incident or anything unusual. After the crash, he was treated for injuries and taken to a police station. He declined to make a statement before leaving with his lawyer. And as of Wednesday, he had yet to speak with NTSB investigators. I wanted to ask you the significance of the amount of speed this train had when it approached the curve. Trains go over this, uh, this particular curve many times a day, and trains don't derail. Here we've got one that's doing twice the speed, and it derails. Sir, you could see the engine detached, seven cars off the tracks, one almost completely gone. At daybreak today, the scope of the disaster revealed. You can see the disaster most clearly from the air. The train was traveling on a track that... I have good reason to believe that if the train was moving at 106 miles an hour around that curve, it, it would not have, uh, on its own power, derailed. Because those curves are embanked. It's just like when you're going down the highway, you see the embankment in the highway to keep the uh, uh, the curve or uh, on a racetrack, for example. Uh, those those high speed curves are embanked. If you take a close look at this picture, you'll see that there's embankment there. So the train would not have flipped off where they said it flipped off if it was doing 106 miles an hour, which it wasn't. About a 45 degree angle with the rest of the track. A couple of the cars on the track are still intact, but I count one, two, three, four, five cars at least that have left the track. Most of them are intact except for one car. It appears that it hit some of the support equipment around the tracks at a terrific speed. I don't see no support equipment like here that that car could have hit. You know, the media is always trying to make you believe something with its pictures. See, they're brainwashing everybody into thinking a particular thing based on what they're saying, not on what they're seeing. Rajan Shah says the most frightening part of the derailment was when the lights went out. It took a few minutes, I think, for everyone to realize of the amount of pain that they were in, and that's when you really started to hear the screaming. He fractured his vertebrae, a disc, and ribs, and will be at Hahnemann University Hospital for the next few days. 7.10 p.m., Amtrak 188, leaving Washington, D.C., 238 passengers on board, five crew members. 9.28 p.m., the first call, the train ripping from the tracks on a sharp... Moments later, the emergency calls. We're going to classify this as a mass casualty incident. One train that looks like it's completely in pieces. The urgent search for passengers in the darkness, rescuers using flashlights, surrounded by the twisted cars. Three on their sides, one upside down, the others off the tracks. We have people on the track and a couple of cars overturned. And almost immediately, the images of the walking wounded, covered in blood but alive, many climbing out through windows, some climbing up onto seats to crawl out through the roof. Beth Davids told me she was among them, the scratches to her face. All I just remember was like it felt like a turn. I mean, you could just feel like then you knew it was more than just a turn. Um, I mean, because the whole car was turning on its side. Um, and then it was just kind of the slow moment of darkness as you're kind of like tumbling with people and things and, and chairs. And I mean, all the seats were falling. The passengers everywhere needing help. The first responders helping this man get medical help. So many patients, they used buses to get them to area hospitals, many limping and unsteady. More than 200 treated at local hospitals, 10 in critical condition tonight. Inside the tens of thousands of people use commuter trains every day. Positive train controller PTC is up and running. It basically allows a computer to take over the controls of a train if it detects engineer error that could lead to a potential danger. Authorities cite excessive speed as the possible cause of Tuesday's deadly derailment in Philadelphia. But if the speed was an engineer's mistake, that error could have been corrected by computer technology. With a functioning positive train control system, uh, as that train approached that curve, the technology would have actually slowed the train down 
uh, or brought it to a stop. Now you notice he said with a functioning positive train control system, it would have brought the train to, the, to a stop or slowed it down. That's because that car was less than a year old. The engine was less than a year old or somewhere around a year old. And it had uh, a safety device similar to positive train control on it. I forgot exactly what they called it. But with CTA, they called it ATC or automatic train control. But it's all the same function. And these devices slow a train down. Uh, uh, in particular areas when the when the railroad is calling for you to slow down so if the train if that system is functioning then the train is going to is going to cause the operator to slow down or that mechanism will take over and stop the train eight lives lost yesterday this boy looking for his dad my name is mark gildersleeve please help me find my dad and today the horrible news his father 45 year old bob gildersleeve who recently celebrated his 18th wedding anniversary among the victims also a ceo a real estate executive an academic who just got his phd the youngest a naval academy midshipman i just had like an aura about him i can't i can't remember a bad memory i had with him a report that we have confirmed eight deceased from this horrible tragedy. Among them, Mark's dad, Bob Gildersleeve. At 45 years old, tonight his wife said they had just celebrated their 18th wedding anniversary. And Rachel Jacobs, CEO of a tech startup, whose friends and family were searching for her just last night. I think old Laura Fenimore was a corporate real estate executive on her way home from a memorial service. Derek Griffiths, a popular dean at the City University of New York. He had just earned his Ph.D. last month. Today at the U.S. Naval Academy, classmates are mourning the youngest victim, 20-year-old Justin Zemser. He was always having a good time. He's always smiling. You know, I don't know who the target was in that bombing of that first passenger car because that's where the explosion took place at. Whether the person had the bomb on them or not, I'm unaware. But this is what I think. I did a little research on this guy, Gildersleeve, and here it is. I'm going to read part of this article, but you can go to Wikipedia and read it for yourself if you can't see it on your screen. It's about Ecolab. That's E-C-O-L-A-B. It says Ecolab Incorporated, headquartered in St. Paul, Minnesota, is an American global provider of water, hygiene, and energy technologies and services to the food, energy, healthcare, industrial, and hospitality markets. It was originally founded as Economics Laboratory in 1923 by Merritt J. Osborne. I'm going to jump to a later part in the article. You can go back and read it on your own, but it just talks about what Ecolab did and how they changed their name and different mergers and partnerships that, that they formed. But I want to jump over here to read something in particular to you and let you come to your own decision on this. So you can read all of this on your own if you want. But I'm going to jump over here to Ecolab Incorporated 1986 to present. And I'm going to read right here where it says, In the mid-2000s, strategic acquisitions continued, and Ecolab diversified its portfolio of customer offerings by venturing into the food safety management business, as well as a healthcare business unit. In 2005, it opened a new global research development and engineering center in Egan, Minnesota. Food management business, this food management safety business sounds to me like the Food and Drug Administration. And could it be that this guy was actually the target because they had some type of conflict with him because of his views on food safety management? If you read on, you'll find out that in 2011, Ecolab was named one of the world's most ethical companies. So maybe this company's ethics got in the way of politics and they had the necessity to get rid of the vice president 
of the company. There you have it. I've given you my expert opinion on this particular situation. And now you must formulate your own opinion on what you think actually happened. I've given you my theory on what I believe the reason for the derailment is. Now, maybe you can do some additional research and find out something of more clarity than what I was able to come up with. But as far as I can tell, and after all of the video that I went through on this subject, I didn't find any witnesses or any passengers that was on the train. Not one of them said that the train was speeding. So... That's the evidence in itself that the train was not doing 100 miles an hour. The the speed of the train seemed normal to these people who rode this train every day. So you formulate your own opinion based on these facts. And until the next time, y'all, peace.